So we're gonna get started now. Um, I'm Dan Stokels, faculty member in the School of Social Ecology, and I'm very pleased to welcome you today to today's Solutions at Scale seminar featuring UCI's own Professor Mike Mendez. We're fortunate to have Mike on the UCI faculty and as our speaker today, he's one of the leading scholars in the world studying the disproportionately negative impacts of climate change on vulnerable populations as part of the rapidly emerging field of climate justice. Mike is an assistant professor of environmental policy and planning at UCI and visiting scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Before joining UCI in 2019, Mike was associate research scientist at the Yale School of Environment. He has extensive consulting experience in the public and private sectors, including his work for the California State Legislature, late legislature as senior consultant and as an advisor to the California Air Resources Board. In 2021, uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Mike to the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board, and that region serves 11 million people. Mike serves as a member of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine's Board on Environmental Change and Society. He's co-author of the National Academy's consensus study on accelerating decarbonization in the United States, technology, policy, and societal dimensions, and also the fifth National Climate Assessment Report that will be published next year. Mike earned his PhD in city and regional planning at Berkeley and a master's degree in urban studies and planning from MIT. His award-winning book, Climate Change from the Streets, published by Yale University Press in 2020, documents the contentious politics of incorporating environmental justice into global climate change policy. His book was the winner of the Harold and Margaret Sprout Award, sponsored by the International Studies Association and a finalist for the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning, John Friedman Book Award. Last April, Mike was awarded the prestigious 2022 Andrew Carnegie Fellowship, which supports exceptional scholars, journalists, and public intellectuals with the capacity of communicating findings to a broad audience. His current research focuses on climate-induced disasters and social vulnerability, and has been supported by an NSF Early Career Faculty Award. In partnership with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Mike's research documents the disparate impacts of extreme wildfire, heat wave, and drought events on undocumented Latina and indigenous migrants. His project underscores why it is crucial to understand how cascading natural and technological disasters amplify existing inequalities and how to lessen the resulting harms, especially among stigmatized populations. The titles, title of Mike's talk today is Tainted Grapes, Tainted Lungs, Extreme Wildfire Impacts to Undocumented Latina and Indigenous Migrants. So welcome, Mike, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that very warm and uh, gracious introduction. It's such an honor to be here and a pleasure, actually, to be here and talking to my colleagues, um, as well as students in uh, the School of Phys Physical Sciences. I am increasingly getting more students from the engineer, as well as engineering and uh, the, uh, the physical sciences in my class that are eager to learn about how do we apply a human-centered approach uh, to some of the most complex and technical problems facing our society, such as climate change and other sustainability and justice issues. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, and let me just share my screen. Here we, here we go. So again, thank you for, uh, for this opportunity. Um, many, uh, today I'll be talking about some of my new research that does put that justice and human-centered approach uh, to climate change issues and disaster issues. But some of you may know uh, my research agenda from my award-winning first book that Dan mentioned, Climate Change from the Streets. This book uh, contributes to the fields of urban and environmental studies by highlighting how social movements and other actors are influencing the policymaking process to ensure equitable climate change solutions and low-income communities of color throughout the United States and globally. So building on this multi-scalar uh, approach, my uh, research agenda now evolves from policymaking around climate change mitigation that is prospective to adapting socially vulnerable populations from the immediate impacts of climate change. This shift and focus is necessary uh, because impacts are happening sooner than projected and creating a public health emergency, particularly for the most disempowered and voiceless populations. My, re my new research addresses the populations that are rendered invisible during disasters. For example, 
and recent fires, the economic impact of smoke taint is estimated to have cost the California wine industry $3.7 billion uh, in the year 2020. Smoke taint occurs when smoke and ash permeates the skin of grapes, which can affect the taste of and smell of wine, which makes this wine unsellable. However, uh, too much current concern is often placed on the impacts of the wine industry, but not on the farm workers that are harvesting grapes during wildfire events and how their lungs are also being tainted. They are not provided with adequate occupational health and safety protections, let alone hazard pay or disaster uh, federal disaster assistance funds to work in mandatory evacuation zones considered hazardous to the general population. Making these inequities visible is important because in California, as many of you all know, we are experiencing a major climate change crisis. In the last several years, millions of people have been impacted by multiple disasters, fires, blackouts, heat waves, drought, hazardous air quality, and of course, the ever-present COVID-19 pandemic. These compounding of disasters have cascading health, social, and economic impacts. And due to existing structural inequality, these impacts are disproportionately affecting low-income people of color. In essence, wildfires in California are not isolated disasters. They often now compound with other hazards and comorbidities, or what is called a syndemic in the field of public health. So now more than ever, it is crucial to understand how these events amplify existing inequalities and how to lessen the resulting harms, particularly in the context of wildfire impacts to undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants. While this talk is based on impacts on California's most marginalized stigmatized populations, this research has global implications. California's wildfire problems are now impacting the world. Last, uh, in the year 2020, smoke from multiple extreme wildfire events not only reached New York State, but also Western Europe. So California smoke is now, uh, now impacting sensitive populations globally. Given their social status, undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants are particularly vulnerable to disasters such as wildfires and require special consideration and disaster planning. They are disproportionately affected by racial discrimination, exploitation, economic hardships, less English and Spanish proficiency, and fear deportation in their er everyday lives, or what we term their pre-disaster marginalized status. So we really start the premise of our research. If you really want to tackle disaster risk reduction, it starts with the social integration of migrants before disaster strikes, including them in our social safety net, uh, such as uh, health care, unemployment, federal disaster aid, and uh, many more. And it's important to have them part of that social uh, safety net before disaster strikes, because we, we, we all understand uh, typically that when a disaster strikes, it only exasperates existing inequalities uh, that these individuals experience. And for many of them, a disaster creates a, uh, a form of hyper marginalization for this pop population, particularly because uh, uh, there is no social safety net for them. Our research on the 2018 Thomas Fire in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties was developed in a co-productionist framework. Migrant rights and environmental justice groups that lived and worked during wildfire disaster are my co-authors. They were vital contributors to the research design, data collection, and analysis. They were also key in presenting study findings to multiple pol uh, policy audiences at the local, state, national, and even international levels, including the United Nations Migration Agency, uh, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, and of course here in California, the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Moreover, this co-productionist framework shows that undocumented migrants are often rendered invisible in the context of public policy by systemic racism and cultural norms regarding US citizenship and who is considered a worthy disaster, disaster victim. Our research furthermore highlights how political choices are being made that prior, prioritize some lives over others. So today I'll be providing a brief overview of understanding wildfire and inequality. Then I'll jump into uh, an overview of the Thomas uh, wildfire in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties and specific impacts to undocumented uh, Latino and indigenous migrants, their key impacts, broader policy implications, and an update on the new research I'm doing with other migrant rights groups in Northern California, wine country, and Sonoma County, which is now supported by my NSF as well as Carnegie Fellowship. 
According to the uh, recent proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, climate change is making wildfire season longer and more severe. On average, wildfires in the Western United States burn six times the acreage they did 45 years ago. In California, Sierra Nevada, the frequency of wildfires since 1970 has increased by 256%, and as the mountain snowpack melts earlier and fire season extends year round. Moreover, 18 of the 20 largest wildfire by acreage in California have occurred since the year 2000. The, the top uh, eight have occurred since the year 2017. This includes the Thomas Fire. Uh, our region of study is, uh, was currently ranked on uh, number eight until recently. How, oh, however, uh, just about a year and a half ago, uh, the Thomas Fire was co considered the second largest wildfire by acreage in Calif uh, uh, California's history but recent fires in Sonoma County in particular displaced it. And now it's only in the top eight. It went, it went from number two to, uh, to explore how some people and communities are, uh, are more affected by these events than others. Our research shows that differences in human vulnerability to wildfires stem from the range of social, economic, historical, and political factors. These factors include unequal access to disaster preparedness knowledge and resources, contrasting legacies of forest management practices, and the expansion of residential development into the wild land. We further analyze vulnerability through a social uh, cultural context that causes a vulnerability for undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants in the first place. We look at the processes that include factors such as systemic racism and discrimination that expose them to higher risks and underscore how government institutions the disaster relief infrastructure, both public and private, can exasperate existing inequalities during wildfires. However, the majority of uh, wildfire studies and science only analyze uh, groups as inherently being vulnerable. For example, this study from the University of Washington, while valuable for disa uh, assessing disaster risk, frequently, frequently renders invisible the policies and programs that un enable underlying inequalities. Although, although such indices correlate how disaster risk is spread evenly across race, class, or gender, they often fail to eludicate the causation. Moreover, such, such analyses have a big undercount of migrant communities because undocumented ind individuals are undercounted in the US Census, and many of these uh, uh, risk mapping projects use census data. Identifying these populations and systems that render them in, uh, vulnerable is important because in California, while many of these fire prone places are largely populated by higher income groups, they also include hundreds of thousands of low income individuals who lack the resources to prepare or recover from fire. These numbers will likely surge according to the California Cl uh, Climate Change uh, Assessment Report uh, that projects by the end of the century uh, that the wildfire burn area will increase by at least 77%. The state of California, however, does not have an analysis of wildfire based on social vulnerability or more holistic methods to identify and safeguard hyper marginalized populations like, uh, like undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants. In a few moments, I will discuss the direct impacts and responses to the, the Thomas Fire, Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. But first, I would like to provide some background on the fire and undocumented migrants in the region. In particular, particular the forms of discrimination and unsafe labor conditions faced by undocumented migrants. In this regard, as one resident of Santa Barbara told me, undocumented migrants are the invisible population living and working behind the Bugnavilia curtain. They are struggling to survive in a region of wealth and prosperity. This idiom references the fast growing evergreen vine with an explosive magenta color, visibly adorning the gates of uh, expensive estates and farms for added privacy. On December 4th, 2017, the Thomas Fire started north of the city of Santa Paula in Ventura County. It quickly grew to nearly 31,000 acres or 50 square miles in less than 12 hours. Its explosive growth was driven by a combination of climactic events, including dry foliage, low humidity, and increased Santa Ana winds that gusted up to 60 miles per hour. At the time of final containment on January 20th, 2018, 40 days later, the Thomas Fire would be classified uh, as the second largest wildfire in California's history at, the, at that time. The firestorm affected hundreds of thousands of residents in the counties of Ventura and Santa Barbara, 
uh, resulting in massive blackouts, destruction of over 1,000 buildings, and the fatality of one firefighter. Media outlets across the country focus news reports on the loss of coastal and hillside mansions and its impacts to wealthy homeowners and farmers. The Thomas Fire, however, not only destroyed expensive property and crops, but also endangered the health and livelihood of thousands of undocumented migrants. California is home to an estimated 2.6 million undocumented migrants, many of whom are farm workers or employed in service jobs, such as housekeeping and landscaping. In Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, undocumented individuals are estimated to account for more than 9% of the population or 111,000 individuals. While relief efforts in the Thomas Fire have largely been praised as effective, migrant uh, workers were especially impacted uh, by the fire due to the loss of employment, the lack of uh, evacuation information in their native languages, confusion about eligibility for disaster relief services, and poor infrastructure and housing in migrant communities. Undocumented migrant social economic situation is usually precarious. However, the wildfire disaster intensified their already difficult situation. The Thomas Fire, moreover, revealed how undocumented migrants and those with seasonal work visas require special consideration and disaster planning. These individuals are often afraid to seek help and restitution during and after a wildfire for fear of de deportation. Undocumented migrants are also unable to access disaster relief services because of language barriers and in an explicit prohibition from, a, from a accessing federal disaster assistance programs. Governments in the region in particular overlook the needs of low-income indigenous migrant workers and their families. Ventura and Santa Barbara counties are home uh, to a growing indigenous Mexican population. It is estimated that over 25,000 indigenous people from Mexico live and work in Ventura County, while Santa Barbara County is home to a population estimated at 29,000. Concentrated in labor-intensive sectors such as row crops and cut flowers, indigenous migrants perform an increasing amount of the arduous labor, which contributes to the profitability and affordability of fresh fruits, vegetables, and wines. In particular, indigenous people in Ventura County are culturally and linguistically isolated. Many are illiterate and most speak neither Spanish nor English, but only their native languages. It is important to note that Mistec, uh, uh Maya and Chatino people are not Hispanic or Latino, but indigenous. Uh, these ind indigenous individuals are often homogenized with the general Hispanic or Latino population. And to, to just put this into context about how important to it is to have language justice, I want to play a quick audio video of the language Mixteco. Uh, and as you could briefly hear how different the, the language Misteco is from Spanish, and that may sound very elementary to, uh, to folks, uh, like very logical, but you won't understand how many times we have done policy briefings uh, to appointed and elected officials that don't know how different culturally and linguistically uh, Mexican indigenous languages are from Spanish speaking mestizo or Latino uh, individuals. Disparate outcomes occurring during and after wildfires have major environmental justice implications in that certain populations due to their socioeconomic status must live with a disproportionate share of environmental impacts and suffer the related public health and quality of life burdens. With these variables in mind, our research adapts the work in the field of public health that examines issues of intersectionality. That is how social categories such as gender, class, race, indigeneity, immigration status, and and other aspects of human identity intersect with wildfire disaster. An intersectional approach to wildfire disaster emphasizes how certain people and groups will suffer worse effects because of overlapping factors that are often measured uh, separately. So now I'm going to um, go over some of the key impacts that we saw, particularly uh, when this wildfire broke out in 2017 and 2018. Again, uh, uh, this 
Fire started in one year, ended in the next year, uh, lasted well over 40 days. And then the first couple of weeks, there, uh, there was no official government response to help safeguard uh, uh, these individuals that have been living and working in these communities for years, if not decades. So in because there was a lack of official government response, community groups, migrant rights, and environmental justice groups had to step up and fill that governmental void. In particular, issues of language access to emergency information, uh, particularly for indigenous speaking uh, uh, individuals. As I played that audio uh, video, um, you hear the, the need to have culturally and linguistically appropriate information. So at the beginning of the wildfire, these two counties did not have anyone assigned to do live translations of emergency information. So often people think that California is so progressive that there is a Latinization of all uh, in, throughout the state and that filters down into our government services as well. But this is a clear uh, example of, of the disparities that we see in uh, government services and who are providing government services. So in the first uh, uh, 10 days, no live translations were uh, uh, happening. Uh, so these migrant rights groups and, uh, and environmental justice groups had to either uh, translate the information themselves, put it onto social media, uh, WhatsApp, um, um, text messages, text messaging platforms as well at their, as their low power uh, wattage radio station to translate this information. Within the first 10 days, uh, the county governments um, did not do live translation as I mentioned. By the second day, they had uh, one sentence and in, uh, in, in their emergency information that read, if you cannot uh, read this uh, information, uh, you should uh, take it to somebody that can translate it uh, uh, for you. About a day or two later, uh, they, they added a Google Translate button to the emergency information. And a couple of years ago, you know that Google Translate was not that great. And it was translating words uh, from English like wildfire to hairbrush in Spanish. So eventually after 10 days of not having live translation, official tra government translation, um, uh, migrant rights groups and uh, started putting pressure to Sacramento and the governor's office of emergency services had to lend somebody to do live translations 10 days later. Some of this emergency information that was not being translated, including to uh, including about, uh, evacuation zones, mandatory evacuation zones, where to shelter, where to get resources, also was about hazardous air quality. And as you can see from this map here of Ventura and Santa Barbara County, many of the areas where individuals were living, uh, particularly uh, migrant communities and where they were working, work, uh, had air quality index, uh, indexes that were extremely hazardous. As you can see the purple uh, maroon area. And many of these individuals were worrying, uh, working in these very toxic um, conditions uh, with toxic smoke. Also information that was not being translated was uh, uh, other information about uh, safe drinking water access. Many of you know uh, when a wildfire does strike, it, it may knock out power, uh, power stations and that could, that could affect our water uh, community water systems. And when that happens, often fecal matter can get into our water systems. So they issue, uh, governments often issue advisory boil alerts to uh, deal with that contamination. But recent research out of uh, the University of Purdue and uh, University of Washington as well, really shows that we should be looking at other types of chemicals of concern even weeks and months after a wildfire disaster and move away from a, a boil, do not uh, drink a, alert to actually a do not use alert. So uh, when these fires do strike, it can uh, uh, leach um, benzene and other hazardous chemicals into the water system that can be in the water system for many uh, weeks, days, and, and even months as this research uh, shows. And this could be a particularly vulnerable, um, uh, most vulnerable to uh, young children and the elderly. Other issues that happen um, is uh, worker health and safety. Many of these individuals were being asked to in, uh, enter either into mandatory evacuation zones or into work sites that had uh, uh, the highest uh, or the worst air quality, that pur purple maroon area, and weren't provided with adequate uh, occupational health and safety uh, equipment, such as N95 masks, goggles, or, or gloves. Oftentimes, um, it, even if they wanted some of these N95 masks, they, they weren't being handed out to individuals. Cal OSHA, which is the California Office of Occupational Health and Safety, actually has a regional office in Ventura County. 
And the conditions were so toxic in that region that the, the state regulator, that regional office actually closed down its regional office because it, it was unsafe for their the, the, the local regulators. And they eventually opened it up again after community groups and local uh, electeds put pressure on Sacramento to reopen this office. But we, we've uh, done interviews with other um, migrant rights uh, groups and individuals working in the fields during this time and uh, been told that if uh, individuals did get these N95 masks, they were often being given to the men. And there were some cases that they weren't being given to, the, uh, to women. So there was uh, this clear inequality in terms of who was considered a more valuable uh, worker in the field uh, to protect with some of this equipment. And some, uh, some key quotes that we had um, that I just wanna highlight quickly here that we have from some farm workers. The first one is from an indigenous farm worker in Oxnard. He told us, during the fire, I worked three days without a mask. It caused me headaches and, and watery eyes as well as cough. We were scared because we were very near where the fire was coming. The masks were not handed out until the city came to regulate. Another one told us, we all got sick. Our throats closed in from breathing too much smoke and our kids could, uh, couldn't go to school. We had to buy masks and medicine for our throats and some goggles because my eyes were irritated when I worked. Other uh, farm workers told us that they had been working hours, days, and in these very uh, hazardous conditions, and they would come home and literally have black saliva. Other issues that are a key concern uh, is this lack of occupational health and safety standards is a key concern as intensifying wildfires collide with harvest season each year. Undocumented farm workers are shouldering the burden of protecting uh, our state's agricultural um, uh, crops and uh, wine grapes from smoke and ash. Fine particulate matter or PM 2.5 from wildfire smoke, which is a toxic mix of heavy metals and other chemicals from burning structures and objects can be several times more harmful to human respiratory health than PM 2.5 from other sources such as car exhaust. Since 2015, uh, throughout California, and particularly in Northern California, the annual mean PM 2.5 has increased as a result of extreme wildfire events. And these events have overtaken as the main source of PM 2.5 exceedances. The harm that wildfire smoke causes to farm workers and other outdoor workers may be greater than previously thought, bolstering the argument for additional research and policies to help safeguard the most vulnerable and stigmatized populations. There was also key impacts in terms of uh, economic health impact, economic and health impacts to workers. Many of these workers that went into uh, these very toxic or hazardous uh, work sites, again, weren't provided with uh, the proper equipment and some did have uh, illness or, 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 or did get sick, but if, if they missed work or their job site uh, got burned down because of the fire, because of their undocumented status, they were ineligible for unemployment insur insurance and other types of safeguards, including follow-up care from working in these hazardous conditions. Uh, they weren't provided that, any post-exposure uh, types of uh, training. So these individuals are asked to be, uh, in a sense, uh, frontline workers, first responders to protect the agricultural industry, yet they're not provided with any type of hazard pay or social safety net to protect them from working in these hazardous conditions. As one um, a Misteca farm worker told us, the day the fire started, the sky was covered with smoke and we were sent home. The, the next day we didn't work because it was dangerous due to the fire. We lost power because it was cut off by the fire and we lost food and milk for, for the kids. During the mudslides, following the heavy, uh, hot, following the fires, heavy rains caused mud flow from the, the fire debris. We couldn't get to work, and we were told to stay home for two days. So again, uh, the, this issue of unemployment insurance it, it does not uh, extend to undocumented migrants. Uh, with this, there was other impacts to uh, domestic workers and other service workers. Um, for example, one domestic worker reported and told us she was asked to safeguard at home in a fire evacuation zone as her employer fled, fled for safety. The domestic worker found herself trapped by roadblocks and mudslides for about a week. During this time, she was exposed to unsafe air and, and the threats of the fire overtaking the home. When the evacuation uh, orders were lifted and the roads reopened, uh, the domestic worker was asked by her employer to grab a few items from the household before she left. So this really idea of not prioritizing 
uh, safeguarding some of the, uh, these undocumented migrants because of their immigration status and other uh, types of systemic inequality. And uh, the, these worker impacts also affect other service workers, such as landscapers. Uh, after a fire, uh, landscapers and other types of gardeners and other day laborers are asked to clean up all that fire debris. And just like with the, the air quality, um, which is toxic, it's sort of a toxic soup, that debris is also sort of a toxic uh, uh, debris. And oftentimes they're not provided with a, a pro proper training, let alone occupational equipment, uh, safety equipment to protect themselves from these hazardous conditions as well, even after a fire. Um, as one landscaper told us, I could not get to the homes where I worked because the streets were closed. Uh, Two of the homes I worked at were destroyed. One of my good friends was uh, was lost. He had only been living in Montecino for three weeks before he died. I myself am a cancer survivor. I'm the only one who provides for the family. So this quote in particular really acknowledges that these these undocumented migrants, because of the very nature of the work that they do, either in landscape and particularly in, in farm work, are exposed on a daily basis to uh, 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 dust, fumigants, pesticides, poor air quality uh, that affects uh, their health and uh, particularly the respiratory systems and really uh, uh, highlights that these individuals have existing health disparities. And when a disaster like a pandemic or a wildfire uh, collide uh, with existing other, uh, with other disasters and compound and create these compounding disasters and act synergetically to create or intensify uh, disparities, it creates again, what the field of public health calls a syndemic. And then finally, one of the uh, one of the last two impacts was immigration status and disaster aid. As I mentioned before, because of their immigration status, these individuals do not qualify for federal disaster aid, which can really help them in terms of uh, thriving and bouncing back even better after a disaster. You know, recent research shows that after a disaster, the average household um, uh, that requests uh, uh, federal emergency management, federal disaster assistance funds gets anywhere between $30,000 to $40,000 for assistance. So these individuals are not able to recoup any losses of it that they may have. So Ventura County, as well as uh, Sonoma County, were the one of the first two in the entire state of uh, in, in, in the state of California and in the United States to create a private disaster relief fund uh, for uh, for undocumented migrants. So this was uh, the first uh, the first two to do this um, in the entire United States, focused on disaster funding because again at the federal level these funds were not available for them. And uh, since the, uh, it has been launched, um, the 805 Undocu Fund has uh, provided uh, since its inception to uh, present day because of COVID, well over $6 million uh, and grants ranging anywhere between a couple hundred dollars to uh, maybe about a thousand dollars. As one domestic worker told us, my husband uh, uh, was deported just before uh, the, uh, the fire. I was really struggling to find work in the fields. I finally got hired the first week in December 2017, was, was let go once the fire and smoke grew too big and the fruit spoiled. As the only breadwinner, I had to borrow money from friends and family to feed my kids. Our food went bad due to the power outage, adding to our expenses. I, I am grateful for the Undocu Fund uh, assistance, and I am still in need of help and continue coming to my cop for other services. That's one of the migrant uh, rights serving organizations. So this just really shows about how when a disaster does strike, it has a ripple effect. It, and these individuals that are living often paycheck to paycheck and the, an, the average annual income of a farm worker or undocumented person is less than 18,000. So any loss of work can have a major impact uh, to a family. And particularly for individuals that are afraid to uh, go for government services. So under federal uh, um, assistance uh, policies and laws, uh, household uh, can uh, be eligible uh, to get federal disaster assistance fund if it has one legal US resident or US citizenship. It's what they call a mixed household. Uh, so you can have one legal person and then other undocumented and you can request funding for the entire household. But particularly under the Trump administration, individuals didn't access that funding for fear of deportation. Because FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is housed under the Department of Homeland Security, which also houses the Immigration Customs and Enforcement Agency. 
and uh, the application to get disaster assistance funds had a, a, a dis, uh, disclosure saying that this information may be disclosed to uh, Homeland Security. So there was fear that they were gonna be tracked and individuals were gonna get deported in their family and, and targeted. And then finally, uh, there, uh, the last two um, before I uh, end my talk is the loss of regional housing stock. Of course, throughout California, we understand that um, we're in a housing affordability crisis. And when we lose any type of housing, um, it has a ripple effect. And during the, uh, the first couple of days of the fire or first couple of weeks of the fire, there was unscrupulous landlords that were price gouging and increasing rents because there was a further demand um, on housing until uh, uh, there was a stop to that in terms of protesting and um, executive orders that the governor did to prevent any further price hikes in the rental market, as well the loss of uh, transportation infrastructure. So it's not just the fire itself, it's after the fire, when there's fire debris and then heavy rains comes and severs uh, important infrastructure. This is a picture of the 101 freeway that connects uh, the two counties, Santa Barbara and Ventura County. So this prevented individuals from going to their jobs uh, from Ventura to Santa Barbara County and had no other means uh, to get there. And so that further um, uh, prohibited individuals from earning a living. And then finally, and some of the major implication I want to leave you all with is for wildfire research, we really need to think beyond just property values. Uh, as current pol uh, disaster policies render many minority and poor communities invisible. As the case of, of Ventura and Santa Barbara County shows, migrant communities are among the most impacted during wildfires. Unlike race and ethnicity, immigration status has received little attention in disaster vulnerability research. Current disaster policies also fail to account for the complex web of effects that wildfires have far beyond the destruction of property within the perimeter of the fire itself. For example, toxic smoke flows down from burning mountainsides, settling in densely populated valleys below, threatening outdoor workers. Lavish hillside mansions are destroyed or evacuated, leaving low-wage migrant gardeners, housekeepers, and caregivers unemployed. Tourism throughout the region shuts down, putting thousands of hotel employees out of work. From the loss of housing and infrastructure to the closure of schools and job sites, the affected area is much larger than the footprint of the actual fire. For instance, a low-income migrant family living outside the burn area might lose several weeks of wages and be ineligible for federal assistance. They stand to lose far more than a higher income homeowner uh, within the fire risk zone whose property is replaced by their insurance policy, which also pays for her hotel accommodation in the interim. So in this picture here, we, we see uh, a little girl wearing an N95 mask because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we may be, we be become all desensitized to seeing small children wear these, uh, wearing these type of masks. But it's important to note that this photo was taken in the year 2017 and really highlights how this, this population has been living with a disproportionate amount of inequality and exposure to hazards and risks uh, than the general population. So I, I want to leave you with the, one of the main policy implications that we really, again, want to tackle disaster risk reduction. It starts with the social integration of migrants before disaster uh, strikes, including them in our social safety net, uh, uh, ensuring that we safeguard them and provide them with the proper resources where they can thrive uh, in our society uh, before disaster strikes. Again, really highlighting and understanding that a disaster only exasperates existing inequality we see um, um, in these communities and society. And uh, there's some uh, uh, three key takeaways for inclusive disaster planning. We need to legitimize uh, migrant indigenous community knowledge and their lived experience. Um, with that understanding, uh, what, uh, uh, what can they bring to the table and, and disaster planning response to recovery, really bringing them to the table and including them and in, uh, be uh, part of our uh, planning and preparedness resources before disaster strikes. And then third, to bolster Latinx and indigenous NGOs and nonprofit organizations capacity in disaster relief and planning efforts. Many of the individuals are really stepping up when there's no official government response. They're dipping into their small budgets to provide uh, mutual aid services that the government should be providing to this community. And we also need more diverse 
uh, disaster leadership. Um, a recent studies and uh, congressional oversight really highlights that our disaster management uh, system, both at the federal, state, and local level, is primarily white and male. And it doesn't represent um, the communities that are hardest hit from disasters. And so there's a strong need uh, to have our management that's more reflective of our, our society, and in particular, those populations that are suffering the worst effects of, of, of emergencies and disasters. And I can go into this um, in our uh, discussion, but this is just some key findings on my new research project on wildfires in wine country in Northern California, and just really showing that there's vague statewide uh, guidance continually on worker health and safety, that Cal OSHA, which is in charge again uh, with uh, regulating occupational health and safety is understaffed, it only has 26 Spanish speaking field investigators an entire state of California. And as far as we know, none of them speak any indigenous languages. There's une uneven N95 mask implementation throughout the state. And the state has a, uh, and local counties has a very lax policy on, a, on how they allow farm workers into mandatory evacuation zones. Again, they, they, they issue these permits that employers request to allow farm workers to in, enter into mandatory evacuation zones that are considered ha hazardous to the general population for they can harvest crops. And uh, many of these, uh, th these employers don't have emergency plans of how to get workers out in emergency. There's no post exposure health tests for these uh, workers that are being exposed to toxic air quality. Again, toxic air quality that's several times more harmful to human respiratory health than um, car exhaust improper monitoring of air quality index. There's no requirement that these individuals have real-time mobile handheld devices to understand air quality. Oftentimes they're using stationary air quality monitors that are miles away from the actual job site. And there's no adequate field sanitation for many of these individuals. We know when there, it's hot, uh, we have heat waves, people need to drink water, they also need to have bathroom wet breaks and clean themselves, particularly during a pandemic. But just imagine that with having suit and other types of smoke and ash following on you, and there's not adequate field sanitation. And so with that, um, I can go more into the recommendations um, during our Q&A, but just want to acknowledge funding for this research through the National Science Foundation uh, Early uh, uh, Career Program, Innovators Program with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, the James Irvine Foundation, and now the Andrew Carnegie uh, Corporation to continue this work into a book project. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, talk to you about this new and emerging research, and I look forward to engaging in a lively conversation. Thank you. You're on mute. Yeah. I should know better, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Mike, for a, a really excellent presentation. I think your, your research very powerfully highlights the synergistic effects of climate-induced wildfires and the various other kinds of toxic exposures and stressors that vulnerable populations are dealing with. So that, that whole notion of the syndemics um, that befall you know, vulnerable populations. Um, I invite participants to uh, post questions in the Q&A section of Zoom, and I'll just lead off uh, with one question. Um, you know, I was thinking about your very cogent point about the need for social intervention, social integration of vulnerable populations in order to mitigate some of these, you know, public health and uh, social impacts on them. But one of the questions that comes up is at what level of regulation uh, would we think uh, we would have the most effectiveness in sort of redressing some of these problems. So thinking, you know, you can look at the local or the regional or the national level. Uh, at the national level, I think one of the things that uh, are, are potential constraints are very strong anti-immigrant attitudes and policies that have been instituted by in, in our country, certainly in the last administration, uh, numbers of immigrants and refugees admitted to the U.S. were, were drastically curtailed. The infrastructure for processing them uh, basically went away. Um, also, there, there, are, there was a move to uh, undo many environmental regulations that would protect these folks from exposure to toxins. So we have this web of um, societal issues that 
can make it really hard to, to be effective at the social intervention level, even at the local level. So I was wondering how this is, I'm sure you've bumped up against this in your work and, and how you've tended to, uh, to, to deal with it in some of your research. Excellent question. I, I think that's an ongoing uh, issue. Uh, you know, ideally, it, it, these issues should be um, filtering down from the federal level because a, a majority of the funding uh, for disaster uh, relief services is coming from the federal government, particularly from FEMA, HUD, and a couple other of the agencies. Uh, but the reality, as you mentioned, it, 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 it's, we're in a stalemate um, in sort of a very highly politicized um, uh, uh, environment in Washington, D.C., and it really uh, falls upon uh, state and county governments, which already do the majority of disaster planning and uh, relief efforts to try to include these individuals. But we're always pushing ag against uh, systemic uh, uh, discrimination and racism uh, that continually doesn't want to include them um, in this, uh, these disaster uh, planning efforts. And it, it really, it, it, what it, what is changing some of these individuals is that these communities and migrant rights organizations teaming up with environmental justice organizations and other social justice organizations really pushing back um, uh, you know, from 2017 onward and really uh, uh, trying to shed the light about the lack of resources and the disparate impacts that are happening to these individuals because of intentional political choices that policymakers at all levels of government are making not to safeguard these communities and prioritize some lives over others. So groups are really stepping up and uh, uh, exercising self-determination and highlighting um, and highlighting how these disaster policies are rendering invisible these communities. Now, obviously, these communities are not visible in any real sense, but because of the political choices that are uh, that uh, politicians are and policymakers are making, they're rendered invisible to our disaster infrastructure, both public and private. And groups have been really active in trying to highlight these human-centered approaches. So that's why I, I started this um, uh, uh, discussion earlier about how, how do we have a uh, human-centered approach to technical problems, scientific problems that are our nature, but also uh, but, uh, but become abstracted when we have these big data models um, mm -hmm. that are showing risk or exposure without really showing that human face. And I, and I really think that the NGOs uh, um, at the uh, the ground have been really effective in, in some parts of the country, not everywhere, obviously, uh, to really show that human side and face and gain some traction, uh, particularly um, since the COVID-19 pandemic and many of the lessons learned that happened in 2017, 2018, when the, the first extreme wildfire events kind of hit California. Um, these, these NGOs and migrant rights groups, environmental justice groups became de facto disaster managers, mutual aid organizations. And talking to these individuals, uh, they became experts and created their own type of infrastructure and network uh, capacity throughout the state. So while uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, these communities, while it, 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 it disproportionately affected these communities, many of them tell me it would have been far worse had it not been for uh, the, the three or, or so years prior of disaster planning that these organizations were forced to step up and engage in. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for that uh, response to the question. There's another question that's been posted anonymously. Um, how are undocumented individuals organizing against these structural inequalities during disasters? Yeah, so, so that idea of self-determination that these individuals are really asserting uh, that they're experts in their own right, uh, that they, they are uh, disaster, disaster, uh, disaster management uh, experts, and they're highlighting uh, both in terms of scholarship, the, the work that we're doing together, as well as news media, uh, uh, really highlighting the stories uh, of these disparate impacts uh, and really trying to spot like the intent, that attention there. But in terms of practical, proactive measures, is it's here at least here in California, changing some state laws as well as administrative policies on the disaster management. We see more um, disaster grants that the governor's office has been issued with an explicit focus on socially vulnerable populations, regardless of uh, immigration status, and uh, really earmarking uh, those those funding for those communities and making uh, uh, that uh, contingent uh, on making sure that disaster plan is more inclusive. So county governments, 
uh, if they want to get some of these grants, they have to show that they're being inclusive of all populations from undocumented migrants to gender issues to LGBTQ communities and various others. So those have, have been some, uh, some big improvements uh, to the most part. We saw during the COVID-19 pandemic how these, these organizations, because of all prior year uh, um, uh, advocacy uh, you know, of creating private disaster relief funds, that they were able to get the governor's office to commit 75 million and then another 50 million from philanthropic organizations for a total of 125 million for COVID relief. So that was a big step forward. It was temporary, 125 million, and that, that, that went out in less than a month. So obviously there's still a need for a permit disaster uh, relief fund and ensure that these individuals have additional safeguards. So there's several bills in, in the legislature this year um, that they're working on to provide additional protections uh, to workers uh, during disasters. Thank you. Um, in terms of building adaptive capacity in vulnerable populations, uh, you mentioned that there is a potential to implement certain kinds of interventions that can enhance social integration, for example, making sure that there's language justice and cultural sensitivity uh, in communications about public health risks and things like that. Um, are there any studies that are now um, sort of after those interventions are implemented, trying to assess whether they make a difference in terms of, you know, the, the areas where they're being uh, rolled out, are the populations there showing sort of reduced negative impacts of exposures or is there anything like that going on uh, sort of to evaluate these interventions or strategies? Not, not yet, because uh, many of these new interventions are either ongoing and uh, are uh, starting to be unfolded or uh, just uh, were implement, uh, implemented maybe about a year or two ago. Okay. So uh, much uh, work still needs to be done. Governments at the state and local level still need to do better. Um, but it's slow progress. And it's really, as, but we do know from previous studies and disaster studies uh, that a community that is uh, well prepared that meets regularly um, and uh, educates their community about um, uh, potential disasters are the more likely to be able to weather some of those um, impacts um, when, when they do occur. And we're starting to see that a little bit uh, within the farm worker community and, and the general migrant community as well, but so much more needs to be done. Yeah. Definitely. And we see this throughout, you know, if, if you look out at extreme weather events, it's not just wildfires, uh, hurricanes in Texas, as well as the East Coast, like New York. Um, it, some of the hardest hit ones are undocumented migrants, Latino, um, as well as uh, Asian, uh, Asian uh, immigrants as well, particularly in the East Coast that are disproportionately affected. We saw the last storm in New York many of these undocumented migrants living in basement apartments that were totally flooded okay. and some dying there and others were just suffering a lot of property loss and other social type of impacts. Excellent. Um, this question comes from Carlo Pizarro, who loved the presentation. And uh, the question is, your title itself made me reflect on the workers who were exposed to wildfire smoke during the Thomas fire and then potentially contracted COVID before the vaccine rollout. Given that the symptoms of both COVID and wildfire smoke exposure are often respiratory related, are community organizations beginning to hear about how these overlapping hazards have further impact, impacted these workers and health? Unfortunately, no. And I, I you know, what I think is the workers are starting to, to understand um, about uh, not just acute impacts, but long-term chronic impacts. Uh, mm -hmm. that they're having from the very nature that, that, that uh, uh, of the work that the U.S. farm workers or other outdoor workers and how um, exposure or continual exposure to, uh, to wildfire smoke is, is having an impact to you uh, on them. And they're, they're starting at, in our interviews and in our discussions with NGOs, that's starting to come out uh, slowly. But adding that labor of COVID, no, not, not, not entirely. But what one of the key things that are coming out and um, it's often overlooked is that idea of trauma uh, yeah. that these individuals or PTSD that they're having from year after year of wildfires happening uh, to them and sort of that burnout 
that uh, or that that dread and stress that they they get every time wildfire season or a wildfire um, gets starts up in the region and, and sort of that uh, additional weathering uh, negative weathering that they, they experience as well. Thanks for responding to that. We have another maybe one to two minutes before the close of the webinar. So if anyone else has questions or Mike, if you want to add any final thoughts, um, you know, we have a little time. So I, Mike, uh, there, there aren't any other questions listed right now. Do you yeah. want to, do you want to close with any, uh, further take homes or, or sure I, so i i think we again you know um when we think of these disasters particularly uh, wildfires uh or other types of disaster that they don't happen I, isolation that we need to think beyond just property values again and uh, thinking about sort of the cascading how social economic impacts that happen beyond just the actual footprint of a fire or a disaster and how um, our systems for disaster management um, are not often inclusive of individuals uh, that don't own property uh, or individuals that he, that are are vital components of our society or of our economy, and uh, we're not providing additional resources to individuals. And, and so there needs to be a movement for more inclusive uh, disaster planning. Yeah. Well, we're close to the end of the session, and I, I want to thank you so much again for you know really provocative. An important presentation. And I know that whatever large initiatives UCI pursues going forward, climate justice is going to be a very central component of all of that. So uh, your work is, is really key and your leadership in this field is really valuable and appreciated. No, thank you. No, thank you for the opportunity. And, and I'm really excited that the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the physical uh, sciences uh, as well as engineering have been interested in these issues uh, and really understand that the need to have social science um, uh, and disaster studies and climate change issues. And again, having that human centric approaches and uh, making the, the these impacts uh, have a human face and not so abstract and really understanding what does these impacts mean on the ground at the front lines of these events. So thank you for the opportunity. Terrific. Terrific. Well, we're just about at noon. So uh... Thanks again to everyone for attending, Mike, for your presentation. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Take care.